Okay, so good morning. Good morning once again. Good to have all of you here today. Um, I think before we get started, uh, I just wanted to address a couple of questions that came up last week. And um, I think I'm just trying to see if the people who asked the questions are on the call. There were three questions. One was about surrogacy. I think that question was by Kennedy. And I think Kennedy is on the call. The question on vows was with by Sam. I think Sam's also on the call. Thank you, Sam. And there was a question on um, um, when someone is in sin, uh, how do we deal with that? Was Christopher? Christopher is also on the call. Great. Okay. Good. So we'll just spend maybe two, three minutes. Uh, just uh, you know, I didn't want to leave that off it is as it was. So uh, just want to address that quickly uh, in the in the first couple of minutes. We'll take on the question on surrogacy, and I think that question was from Kennedy. I'm not sure, but I, I'm just going to address it. Um, so the question was, is surrogacy right? So for those of us who may not know what the meaning of surrogacy is for a couple who is unable to um, have children of their own, uh, they take on another person or another, uh, uh, usually a woman, because uh, you know birthing happens. I mean, the development of the fetus happens only in a woman. Um, so usually a woman. There are times it can be taken by, by, from men as well. Uh, so I'll explain. There are two different kinds of surrogacy that generally is seen. The traditional surrogacy where um, uh, the, the, the sperm as well as the egg, um, sorry, the, the sperm of the married man uh, is um, you know is there's artificial insemination where the sperm is given to a surrogate mother that is a third part in, a pa person a third party uh, and not to the wife themselves because there could be certain issues that the wife may be having so she becomes a surrogate mother she carries part of the um, uh, part of the, uh, the 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 genes of 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 the the couple so that is just the husband's and then her her uh, egg is taken and that's where that's called traditional surrogacy whereas gestational surrogacy is where it is done in vitro that is the sperm as well as the egg is uh, you know it, it is um, fertilized outside and uh, the the embryo is inserted into um, a person and that become that's called a gestational surrogacy so these two things is what is generally there are others also but i think we will just deal with that here so you know as as i did some reading um the 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 certain the certain uh, events of surrogacy that we can see in scripture is the um, Abraham Sarah Hagar story where uh, where we see that uh, Sarah takes Hagar and gives her to Abraham in order to conceive a child because um, she was not able to uh, at that time so this this was something that was was seen at that times in those times when a woman was not able to bear children there would be maids or other people who were given in so that they could continue the line uh, of, of the family so what we see from that story is that uh, you know using a surrogate parent definitely when you look at that, there was in, in that entire story, you see there was a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, a lot of confusion through that entire um, process, that arrangement. So one thing that Hagar did not want to do was did not want to give Ishmael over to Sarah when she when he was born. OK, and this is something that we see very often happening even today, that uh, they discover that they that the surrogate mother discovers that they have um, uh, developed such a strong attachment to the um, unborn child and find it difficult to give it away after it is born, even though there may be financial compensation that that uh, that's there. And there are I've seen a couple of movies in that uh, in on that line as well. OK, so the Bible specifically does not call out um, or uh, 
you know, say anything about the use of a surrogate mother, but definitely I think there are certain principles and certain moral ethics that I think we can pick up from scripture. So one thing that we've been studying is um, we've seen that marriage is designed to be between one man and one woman only, right? And so when you bring in a third person into this relationship, there is a third parent. And this, of course, definitely brings about very difficult as to, um, uh, you know, uh, would would the child know about the sur about the surrogate mother? Uh, what what kind of expectations uh, would this uh, would this lead to? Uh, does the surrogate mother have any rights to the to the child? Um, and and I think these are also practical concerns that should be considered before someone you uh, attempts to use a surrogate and um, sometimes we see that couples also use certain family members and that often can get even a, a lot more trickier um, because of the strong the how the 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 family member may have a strong attachment to the couple uh, I, I think in principle what we also need to see is yes we see that God is the one who blesses uh, just like God blesses us with everything else, like a job, a wealth, health, so also he blesses us with children, right? And there are times that the couples do not have children, and we see that children are a gift from the Lord. I read somewhere where it says, you know, the Bible says the children are a gift, and not right, right? But uh, using uh, surrogacy out of defiance, or an arrogance against God is something that would be would be sin, um, but I think uh, it is important to consider to prayerfully consider this and seeking God's will and His guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit in a couple who would wish to do that. Um, but yes, keeping these principles in mind and the fallouts or the consequences that it could bring about through what we've seen in scripture through the through the story we were talking about it's something that we see that can cause uh, pain and hardships and and difficulties so a, a decision like that is something that really needs to be taken wisely right so uh, that's the stand i have so to be able to say is surrogacy completely right is surrogacy completely wrong mm, is, is a stand, I, I would say, take it as a principle uh, where, where, we, where we see marriage as that defined by two people only, that is a husband and a wife. My next, uh, my next thought was, if uh, you know, a childless couple wanted a child who could not have a child uh, you know, naturally, the next good option is adoption to be able to adopt is uh, is something that uh, that we see in lines of scripture of of in a sense of you know being uh, kind to the to the needy to the poor to the orphaned so uh, uh, um, a gesture of adoption is something where you are giving someone uh, a home a life and also a legacy to follow so i'd say if you're looking at surrogacy and adoption um, you know Open your eyes to the to the understanding of adoption. That 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 seems to be a lot more um, stronger when when you look at it biblically. All right. I I I hope I address that in the best way possible. I'm going to look into the next question. The next question was. Um, uh, yeah, so, so Sam's question was, I have a question on marriage vow that came up during a conversation. Um, uh, it's asked us not to take any vows and our yeses to be yes and no to be no. So so what his question was, uh, should, then is taking a marriage vow a wrong thing? Okay, so if you look at uh, the verse that you bought by uh, Sam, it was Matthew 5, 33 to 37. I'm just going to quickly read it. Um, uh, you have heard that the law of Moses says, do not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say, don't make any vows. If you say by heaven, it is a sacred vow because heaven is God's throne. And it says, you know, do not swear by earth, by Jerusalem or by my head. Just say a simple yes, uh, I will or no, I won't. Your word is enough to strengthen your promise with a vow shows that something is wrong. 
so here jesus is not uh, i think i don't think he's talking about those formal official promises like you make in a contract or in a vow or in a uh, that the, these kind of questions do come up even in a courtroom is it okay to make a courtroom uh, i think it applies to times when people try to um emphasize their honesty using an oath like you know we we may say i cross my heart or on my mother you know mother promise or let me let me die if i if i'm not uh, if i'm not uh, saying something that is true um you know or the words that you say i swear or uh, you know all of that so the what it implies is that the oath is guaranteeing the person is telling the truth and has good intentions that's what it's meant to imply but jesus flatly says that Uh, you know let your yes be yes and your no no be no so in other words um uh, that that we should be known for our integrity so as a believer as a person who's known for our integrity we should not really need to actually uh, you know base our promises on anything uh, our our word should be yes and no and that's based on what we what we we stand on and uh, so jesus says not to swear on anything but just make it simple so it does not refer to the formal oaths and vows that you're making there it's a covenant vow that you're making you know a commitment you're making to another person in the presence of a uh, uh, you know of a, of an audience or of a, of a congregation so i think it's a little different in what he was meaning to say as against what um, mm, uh, about it about marriages being being a vow or a oath all right i hope i answered that too uh the last one was uh, uh, christopher's question on we were talking i think about people in a live in relationship and what would happen if um, you know in spite of their warnings uh would it necessitate them to leave the church so uh, that 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 was one of the so i'd want to bring back and i think we had a discussion of this in one of the mentorship programs where we we brought about the scripture on matthew 18 15 to 17 so uh, we take these principles and i'll quickly read this out um it says if another believer sins against you go privately and point out the fault if the other person listens and confesses it you have won that person back but if you are unsex- unsuccessful take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses if that person still refuses to listen take your case to the church if the church decides you're right but the other person won't accept it uh, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector okay so just taking this as principle i think one of the things that we would want to do is uh, bring about correction and discipline and love that does not mean we overlook sin or own sin we bring it about go privately discuss fault point out what it is and wait to see if there is restoration uh, and if that doesn't happen yes doing it maybe a couple more of times and uh, you know working with others to do it so uh, uh, you know taking maybe a leader or a, or a counselor or a pastor to help to reach reach out to that uh and if it continues to be repeated again you know we show as much grace as possible but it also really depends on what kind of um, uh, uh you know issues or or reasons it is now let's say that someone a person in ministry is into an extramarital affair and they continue to hold on to that um you would need to take a stand and uh, decide to bring to step them down from that position of leadership till they they bring they bring themselves into correction or you know uh, anyone who is who is there uh knowing the truth knowing and understanding that what they are doing is sin but yet does not come to a place of repentance and restoration uh, that's when you know you actively take a call of stepping them down and uh, you know getting them to get their act straight before they can come back uh, into working uh, either in in church or um, or you know being a part of the ministry um Uh, i think these these are these are certain uh, and, and scripture gives that uh, you know understanding of <clears throat> how we could do it so i think basic principles is in love showing grace um yes a couple of times where you are uh, you do a bit of correction and discipline uh, but depending on 
where they are, the positions that they take, uh, it is important to take the call on whether they continue on with, with that place of ministry or not. All right, I hope I quickly answered. Um, great. Okay, all right, so um, going on to, to today's uh, lesson, um, you know, today's lesson is actually quite a difficult topic to discuss about, and uh, it's something that is not often spoken about, is not often uh, discussed in church, uh, but it is extremely necessary that we, we highlight um, the specific chapter. So I'm on chapter 13, and um, I'm on page 143, 143, where we are going to be learning about establishing certain boundaries. Okay. Um, uh, so in my, in my experience in counseling, there are many times that uh, uh, I come across couples who, who come together and seek help because there has been either infidelity, unfaithfulness, an extramarital affair, adultery that has taken place. And uh, like all of us do understand, uh, a, couple, a couple being in a committed relationship where there is a third party that gets involved, especially in an emotional or a sexual uh, uh, way through a sexual affection, definitely can break and severe and deeply wound and hurt a marriage. And uh, going through those sessions and uh, sittings with people who face that, you, you begin to see the kind of pain, the kind of rejection, abandonment, and the struggles that people go through, right? And uh, we, we understand and we notice that uh, marriage in itself is not a, it's not a pill for you to uh, protect yourself from uh, any kind of uh, you know, any kind of uh, intrusions, and especially when it comes to uh, adultery or extramarital affairs. So being married does not safeguard you completely uh, from not having those feelings. And I think that's something we all need to be real about, that uh, um, uh, that marriage, being in marriage, uh, does not protect you from, or does not make you immune to adultery or to, to affairs or to emotional entanglements. And just as much as you see this as something that's common in the outside world, it is very prevalent even among a believing circle. You may, I mean, and there are so many, uh, you know, we don't want to pick up names, but there are so many, uh, you know, in the Christian world and um, in, in uh, that, that we have seen that uh, certain uh, um, uh, issues like this have cropped up. Uh, often we need to, uh, you know, also see and understand that these affections uh, outside of marriage usually don't happen, you know, all of a sudden. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, someone doesn't wake up on one day and say, okay, I'm ready for an affair. It doesn't happen like that. And it is something that is, that takes place very, very gradually, takes place often casually. It could be someone, maybe a, a colleague at work, or it could be a common a friend, or it could be someone that you're ministering to, that um, you know, get getting into casual conversations, uh, and often it is with good intentions that those initial meetings happen. You know, maybe just to share, or uh, maybe you're just empathizing or sympathizing with somebody, but then slowly those those casual conversation leads into something that is more stronger that can finally lead into a place of sin. So this chapter really is looking at how, first of all, recognizing what are uh, uh, what are some things that we may need to do to safeguard our marriages, as well as uh, what are some things we need to do uh, uh, to restore someone who probably is in, who's already been through a situation like this. So when we look at scripture, uh, we see that scripture has a lot to say about, um, about this. It, it talks about 
the danger that's there. It talks about consequences. It gives us warnings. It gives us different reasons and, you know, protective measures as to how we need to ensure that we do not get there. So as we go through this chapter, we're going to be looking at a couple of um, uh, things uh, is, yes, we look through scripture and see what it has to say about uh, um, about setting our boundaries. We're going to be looking at certain consequences of it. We're also going to be looking at how we can safeguard our marriages and also what is the freedom from that. So I'm at page 143 and maybe I'd like to read a couple of scriptures um, and a lot of the scriptures that's written here is taken from either the Good News Bible or the message. And uh, you can actually really see the true essence of, of what is what is being, being said there. So can I request somebody on page 143 to read Proverbs 2, 16 to 22? Proverbs 2, 16 to 22. Anybody who can um, just unmute and quickly read, please. Shall I read, ma'am? Yes, Avni, go ahead. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16 to 22 says, Wise friends will rescue you from the temptress, that smooth-talking seductress, who's faithless to the husband, she married years ago, never gave a second thought to her promises before God. Her whole way of life is doomed. Every step she takes brings her closer to hell. No one who joins her company ever comes back, ever sets foot on the path to real living. So join the company of good men and women. Keep your feet on the tried and true paths. It's the men who walk straight who will settle this land, the women with integrity who will last here. The corrupt will lose their lives, the dishonest will be gone for good. Amen. Thank you, Avni. So even as the scripture is talking about a seductress, okay, we we also, this is not just with a reference to a woman, it is also, uh, we take it in reference to a man as well. We see over here how um, it, it talks about the way of the seductress, how the way of the seductress is something that it brings someone closer to hell and uh, to be careful it says beware be careful about what what a seductress or someone who is wayward can do to you uh, to you and to your marriage uh, another verse it's at the end of that page which is proverbs 7 21 to 26 if someone else could quickly unmute and read proverbs 7 21 to 26 can i read go ahead go ahead kennedy Treat wisdom as your sister and insight as your closest friend. They will keep you away from other men's wives and from women with seductive words. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. Somebody can read Proverbs 7 21 to 26, please. 21 to 26. So she tempted him with her charms, and he gave in to her smooth talk. Suddenly he was going with her like an ox on the way to be slaughtered, like a deer prancing into a trap. Where an arrow would pierce its heart, he was like a bird going into a net. He did not know that his life was in danger. Now then, sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let such a woman win your heart. Do not go wandering after her. She has been the ruin of many men and caused the death of too many to count. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So, you know, uh, scripture is very clear. and there, there are a lot more other scriptures that actually tells you that this is something that you would see, uh, something that you would observe all around you. And often... Um, you know, specifically looking at this and, and in my experience of counseling, I have seen, you know, people talk about how there are people who wait, just like how scripture says, you know, who prowl and who wait for the next victim. 
you know, the waiting for someone to devour, waiting for somebody to catch hold of, to get into an adulterous relationship. And um, often there are th these, um, we see, I mean, in, in a metropolitan city like where we are in Bangalore, the workplace is, is a very common place that you see um, people lurking around this way. So scripture warns uh, about it and says it, it requires our wisdom and our grace to identify and to know how to keep away from the seductions of people. All right. Uh, um, if, if you look at Proverbs 9.17, it says stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Now, uh, like, like I was telling you, you know, a lot of times people do not get into a relationship all of a sudden. It is something that happens very, very gradually. Often they are casual friendships that take on. You know, you may just be meeting in for coffee uh, and uh, you know, just sharing some of your problems or, you know, it could be sharing certain, uh, certain uh, you know, extremities about your spouse. And there you begin to see that the other person seems to understand and, uh, you know, is helping you through it and asking you to stand up and stand strong and that they are with you and they are um, they're going to support you and all of that. And 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 thereby slowly beginning to see that there are those emotional affections that happen. So uh, and those affections turn into an entanglement. So how do you recognize that one is into an emotional entanglement. Um, and I think one way, one very clear way of understanding if you are entangled with somebody emotionally is just to check to see how often you're thinking of them, right? How often are you moved to give them a phone call or maybe text them? Or, uh, you know, uh, the, usually the excuses are they are my uh, they are my colleagues or, you know, they are people who I'm working with on a project or uh, this is uh, somebody, you know, my junior and I'm mentoring them. Often it comes as an excuse like that. But just understanding, maybe looking at the content of your text or content of the conversation that happens helps you begin to see whether there is a, a sense of entanglement that is building in. And when there come entanglement, it isn't very far that uh, the, the next levels of a physical or a sexual attraction happens and then falling into sexual sin. So it is, as it says, it is a slow fade into that. It, it does not, and, and very rarely, I think the percentage is very rare where people have a one night stand. I'm not saying it's not common, it's, it's not there, but it's quite rare that people have a one night stand at maybe at an impulse. So people are at a party and then they get into something like that, or, you know, as, as a result of some kind of an emotional disturbance as an impulse, they, they would go, go to someone and then, you know, have, have a one night stand. Uh, but most of the times, you will begin to see that affairs and adultery or uh, infidelity happens, uh, you know, it, it's slow and it is progressive and it progressively builds from something that's casual into something that is more intense in Syria. So uh, it is important for us to also understand why, uh, you know, and, and that's something that uh, is important to come to the root uh, source of why this happens. However, uh, it, it does not condone the act at all. It does not condone the fact that someone is being uh, uh, adulterous, but we still need to figure out what is it, because it's only when we begin to see the reasons are we begin to, do we begin to understand how is it that we can prevent it, right? So some of the reasons why people fall, and I think a lot of times why people fall into this, uh, uh, this kind of a um, uh, sin is, number one is, as, as a result of just feeling that their emotional needs aren't met or there could be a sense of abandonment or a sense of rejection, just feeling that, you know, your spouse isn't good enough uh, to, uh, to, to meet your needs or there may be 
actual struggles happening within the relationship that is depleting on the emotional tank of the of the couple so a lot of times it is because there are emotional hurts or or there is there are certain needs that are that have gone unmet or there are certain expectations that have not been fulfilled or there is some form of a pain or a trauma within the marriage that has not been resolved and that continues to stand a sense of unforgiveness continues to stand and and as a result you know that that begins to be a sharing of these um uh, issues with someone else some of the other um uh, reasons could be you know just falling back into those those earlier affections or earlier relationships which have not been cut off or which have not been dealt with at all um uh, you know maybe those those fantasies that the people have had about their teenage crushes you know just g generally become alive and and uh, they rebuild a connection and then then begins this this slow fade back again so uh, the, what we do see is that any time people are at emotional needs or when there 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 are emotional um gaps or lacunae that's when they become most vulnerable to to an affair because let's understand i think let's be real and know that as uh, uh, humans we we have a need to be loved a need to be cared for need to be accepted need to feel secure and uh, when it is not found in these intimate relationships and uh, or when you know the focus is so much on that and not on the actual the source uh, of who is god and that begins you know people begin to look out uh, you know, on to other sources so so usually it is that emotional need that causes people to be vulnerable to these affairs there are other reasons such as um you know sometimes there may be people just living with very poor moral values and uh, willing to um just compromise on those those values and and we we also do see that among christians or believers you know who may be attending church who may be um reading the word who may be you know tongue talking but yet may not or you know they may be they may be thinking of of how good god's word is but then has not really uh, it, it hasn't really set into their heart where their commitment to god and his word is poor or a commitment to the family or commitment to um to what god's word says so those those kind of reasons where the standards where there are no uh, moral standards that they keep up to uh, sometimes also for those who have a low tolerance to to stepping into sin uh, also you know who may not consider this as sin but may consider this as something that is a uh, not not really understanding their sexuality as something that god has given them and god would like them to keep it preserved and sacred you know and and is and is in an understanding that it can be explored i mean i have seen people like that with where they feel that sexuality is very personal and it is something that can be explored even though they may be believers uh the other reasons yes is a sense of entitlement that may come uh because of where they are positioned or the kind of power they hold or the influence that they hold and they just seek for some kind of novelty or excitement and you know something new to come about so no matter what the um uh the 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 reasons are uh, you know we we need to look back and understand that it is something that causes a marriage devastation it definitely causes a deterioration in the way marriage was meant to be uh, scripture also okay uh, can i stop here for 2 minutes and just take any questions here if not i i will go on all right okay so scripture also talks about uh yeah is there someone with a question yes uh thank you sorry i can't hear you oh sorry could you sorry. slightly louder okay so oh, now can you hear me yes go on yes go on the first scripture we read uh from 2:16 to 22 says that the vows are toward god so when people people, people when people are getting married are they supposed to say vows to god instead of each other or 
do we or oh, the way we do it is wrong because now we say vows to each other the husband to say vows to the wife and the wife to the husband but here uh, it says uh, the vows you say to God so in mm -hmm. my, I need some mm -hmm. clarity thank you Pastor. okay all right so so I uh, the vows are being said in the presence so you're making a vow in the presence of God to him as well as to your spouse that you promise to take your, your vowing um, in the presence of God. So you're making that covenant relationship. You're making that covenant relationship with your spouse in the presence of God. So he is witness to it. So when he's witness to it, he's you're also saying, God, you are witness to this vow that I'm making to my uh, to my partner, to my to my spouse. So it is something that you you do like like a promise that you you are making a covenant promise that you're making to your spouse in the presence of God. So he is the biggest witness over there. So he stands as witness in bringing this vow to fruition. I hope that I answered that, Mangi. Yes, that. Thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so scripture <clears throat> going on. Scripture talks about uh, what are some of the things that we need to take caution about. So there are there are a couple of words of caution we see in the next uh, um, you know couple of scriptures that we that we see. Um, one of the examples that we that we have we we can take from is King David. We see how um, David you know was was a was a, a person who loved God. Uh, he was a man who who you know it says he was a man after god's own heart and we see his journey from being a shepherd boy uh, to be someone who was uh, who was being uh, pursued to to be killed to someone who who got onto the throne of uh, of um, of as a king right and who continues to be um, someone who's being referred to uh, as uh, jesus's line right so we see how david accomplished so many things uh, for himself as, as a king. And if you look through scripture, it talks about uh, a lot of victories that he had. As a king, he had a lot of victories. There were, there were the Ammonites, there were the Edomites, there were the Philistines, and there were chunks of uh, people and armies that he fought against okay and and the, he was in in uh, his time was a, a time of great um, uh, military success and you see how in scripture it actually shows of how god made him victorious it god was with him wherever he went god you know helped and god showed and, and we see that throughout however when when we look at uh, the time just before um, David fell into sin. We read in 2 Samuel 11 verse 1, and I'm just taking that, uh, uh, just, just that verse. It says, when that time of year came around again, the anniversary of the Ammonite aggression, David dispatched Joab and his fighting men of Israel in full force to destroy the Ammonites for good. They laid siege to Rabbah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. Okay, and I want to bring two points over here. One is that um, this was a time where David was at the greatest time of his success. And we see often that uh, um, in a time of heightened success is often when we do not, um, we do not keep ourselves guarded. That's a time, either at the time of success or at the time of crisis or a, or, um, or, or a difficult affliction, are times when we, don't, we are most vulnerable at these points of times. And uh, this is this. It is during this time that we may see that uh, our, you know, our understanding is poor. Our, our, uh, you know, we are emotionally either, you know too too excited or emotionally too depressed and as a result you know our judgment gets gets poor and there is where there are wrong choices that we tend to make and we fall into something that we may normally not um, do when when we are okay and, and those defenses are down and we often get into times of difficulty and trouble the second point that i want to bring about here is it says 
you know, when the time of year came around again, you know, when people went for war, what was David doing? David stayed back. He stayed back in Jerusalem. Uh, so I think there's an additional understanding here is when you are called, when you know that you're called to do something, you know, go ensure that you're doing it and don't stay back because, you know, it, he probably just wanted to relax and have a good time. So when there are certain responsibilities, when he should have been actually out for war, he would have probably been in the wrong place. So keeping ourselves on guard in, in these specific areas of how we need to ensure that we keep our guard, hold our defenses up at times of crisis or at times of success, and also being in the places where God has has asked us to be. And I want to take this as an example. You know, often maybe it's a party, right, that you know that you shouldn't be going into, um, probably because you know the kind of people who are there or the kind of situation that they may be. It may be an office uh, get-together or things like that, or it may be something that, you know, there are just three, four people going. You understand that it may not be really right to be there. It says, you know, be careful. It says when David, he was supposed to go and he was lurking around on his terrace and, this, and that's what actually ensued. So being on guard of these two things. The other scripture that, it, uh, that we bring about uh, again, which is, which is in Proverbs 5, 1 to 23, it's, it's a long portion of scripture. I'm not going to get into it, but I just want to highlight one verse, which is verse 20. It says, why would you trade enduring intimacies for cheap thrills with the whore, for dalliance with the promiscuous strangers? So, you know, if you can just take some time to read those 23 verses, it highlights to it, it, it brings about a comparison. It says, uh, when you have something that is lasting, why would you go into something that is a cheap thrill and that which is momentary and that which can get you all ruined and, and dead? Right. So it talks, it, it gives the uh, ex uh, the dif difference saying that your intimacy with your own spouse, that enduring intimacy, the, the, the person that you married is a youth, um, you know, that she is like a fresh flowing fountain. And from her is where, you know, you can you you get all um, your your thrill or, or your satisfaction as against something that is a cheap thrill. So it says, why do you want to trade that? Why would you want to trade something that is momentary uh, for something that you already have? So it's like, you know, you're telling your child, you're saying, you know, if you don't eat this one piece of chocolate here, by the time it's night, you'll get a whole bar, right? It's, it's similar to that. Why would you want to give up something that is so lovely and so precious for something that will give you a cheap thrill for a couple of moments, but can get you into a whole lot of trouble? So scripture talks about that is that nothing, uh, nothing, um, uh, nothing else can take the place of the satisfaction that you have within, within marriage. And, and it gives that kind of a warning, even though it may look thrilling, it may look uh, momentary. It may look pleasurable. Why is it that you would want to to do that? And you know, looking through that, it says, um, "Death is the reward of an undisciplined life." That's in verse twenty three. Your foolish decisions trap you um, in a dead end. So it says, these cheap thrills will finally trap you will finally put you to a place of dead end and to, to a place of death. That is the only course of action that a cheap thrill can do for you. So scripture is extremely clear about, about that. Uh, it also, so uh, the, the next couple of verses in Proverbs 6, 23 to 35 tells you what are the consequences of adultery, what happens in adultery. So maybe I, I would someone like to read that. I'm on page 147. Proverbs 6, 23 to 35. Would somebody quickly read that, please? <clears throat> Anybody? I could. Sure, Sam, go ahead. For sound advice is a beacon. Good teaching is a light. Moral discipline is a life path. They'll protect you from wanton women, from the seductive talk of some temptress. Don't lustfully fantasize on her beauty, nor be taken in by her bedroom eyes. 
You can buy an hour with a whore for a loaf of bread, but a wanton woman may well eat you alive. Can you build a fire in your lap and not burn your pants? Can you walk barefoot on hot coals and not get blisters? It's the same when you have sex with your neighbor's wife. Touch her and you'll pay for it. No excuses. Hunger is no excuse for a thief to steal. When he's caught, he has to pay it back even if he has to put his whole house in hawk. Adultery is a brainless act, soul-destroying, self-destructive. Expect a bloody nose, a black eye, and a reputation ruined for good. For jealousy detonates rage in a cheated husband, while for revenge, he won't make allowances. Nothing you say or pay will make it all right. Neither bribes nor reason will satisfy him. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So, you, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I think this, this uh, version really gives it uh, such meaning and it tells you that getting into adultery, it talks of, of three adjectives. It says it's a brainless act. It destroys your soul and it is self-destructive. Okay. And it says how? It says uh, expect, expect strife, expect that you are going to be beaten up, okay? And maybe not all times physically beaten up, but we have seen that that also takes place. But it, it kills the reputation, it kills trust, it kills relationships. You know, it says of how the cheated husband detonates rage, right? So there is jealousy, jealousy that detonates that rage in a cheated husband who becomes... Uh, who looks for revenge in a in a very strong way so it says nothing that you do can make it right so there is any time that somebody enters into it the consequences can be extremely severe it may seem exciting but the consequences are there like you like it says you know there there are certain cause and effect relationships it says that in verse 27 and 28 can you build a fire in your lap and not burn your pants can you walk barefoot on hot coals and not get blisters? Impossible. Those things will happen. So these consequences, uh, adultery is a cause and effect relationship, is a co has a cause and effect relationship. You do something, it will come up with some kind of a, of, of a reaction or a response. Okay. So as part of this, as uh, now, even as, you know, we have, we have discussed this, uh, uh, um, you know, when we're looking at the seductress, we are also saying that, um, uh, not just men, but even uh, not just women, but even men be on guard. But there are cer certain words of caution that we would like to just bring up on women. Um, and uh, the, the couple of scriptures that it brings about here is in Proverbs 12, 4, which it says, a good wife is her husband's pride and joy, but a wife who brings shame on her husband is like a cancer uh, in his bones. So we do... Uh, now, I think this, sorry, just give me a minute. Yeah, so um, it, it talks about how um, script, um, scripture is showing us how women also, you know, we, we can take the essence from here is, is saying women, how is it that we can be on guard? Uh, so one thing that uh, it says here is, you know, a good wife, is the joy is the pride of her husband so someone um, a wife who is who is um, who is loving who is caring who is careful is a good is a pride to her husband but um, but someone who brings shame is like a cancer right and we know what cancer does it eats it it breaks and the foolishness of a wife can bring about a destruction in home destruction about everything around them it's also uh, a caution for women to stay on guard in the way that um, uh, uh, to, to be careful, to be aware about what the pull is around. Because, uh, you know, there are times that there are going to be people who are waiting to violate or waiting to look for those vulnerable people who will fall into, into that trap. <clears throat> uh, another a part of a woman's defense or protection is also in the way that they 
um, uh, they uh, they appear or the, uh, or the attire that they put up. And we see that again in scriptures of 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10 and 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. And that's something that you could also read where it uh, and, and I'll just highlight one one or two verses. <clears throat> it's in 1 Peter 3, verses 3. It says you should not use outward aids. <clears throat> to make yourselves beautiful, such as the way you fix your hair or the jewelry you put on or the dress you wear. Instead, your beauty should consist of your true inner self, the ageless beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of the greatest value in God's sight. Now, this does not mean two things. It does not mean that it's wrong to groom yourself or dress up or to use jewelry. It does not mean that. It, it, uh, or neither does it mean that by doing so, you are creating um, uh, a sense of attraction. It's just asking you to be on guard. That what, to understand in reality that a man is um, uh, driven by stimulus, visual stimulus. So it is important for a woman to, to keep herself adequately well dressed and well covered so that it doesn't create any sense of, um, uh, of, of, of an issue. So to being able to protect yourself so that you guard yourself. So these are, these are the principles that scripture brings about of how each one of us could be on guard. Like, you know, when you look at the advertisements around, uh, a lot of advertisements have um, you know, a showcase of, of women being either scantily clad or scantily dressed. Um, why? Because that, that seems appealing to, uh, uh, to, to in the advertising field. That's the only way that someone would be hooked on and to, to buy a certain product. So it is important to stay on guard. These are different cautions that are given to both men and to, to women on being, uh, on being cautious of the way that they handle or work themselves. All right. Uh, do we have any questions? I'm sorry, we've moved four minutes into uh, class. Um, if not, we could come back in 10 minutes um, after a break. All right. On my clock, it shows 10.54. We'll be back at 11.04. Thank <laughs> you. 